as the Ayatollah comes to you, or if you know Berlin, and say, okay, fatwa on wine, right? What happens to the, spe- the one who specializes in wine? He's starving. And effectively, anyone who knows history who should despise these models because Ireland specialized in, guess what, potatoes. Yeah. And what happened to Ireland? Two million people died. And actually, the one, and, and one million went to America. I don't know what's worse. But <laughs> uh, 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 the population of Ireland today is four million. <laughs> four or five million. So you realize specialization. So that's the problem. Redundancy, okay, functional redundancy, is have more than one specialization. There's functional redundancy. And we look at it, the beauty of the redundancy example is that mathematically you can ma- map debt as exactly negative redundancy. If you have 100,000 in a bank, 100,000 Swiss, of course, <laughs> in a bank, you have redundancy. If you borrow 100,000 from the bank, you have a debt, you see? It's the opposite of redundancy. If you have two kidneys, you have redundancy. If you sell your kidneys and have to borrow one every day to do dialysis because the economists say it's optimal, you are in debt. So this is where we can map it. And unfortunately, we have been moving away from redundancies. And it's normal that someone who doesn't have two kidneys would die. But we're not letting companies who made the mistake of having too much debt Die. And that's the problem. Yeah, so we can come nicely to this topic of utopia, of course. And, you know, I thought we were not to be realistic, we're to be you know, utopian. And I really, you know, idealistically think, idealistically, that we will be able to break out of this fetish because you talk of, of debt, and this is a fine example of this subject object reversal. In the beginning, deficits or inflation or any other tricks of the, of the, of the public of the economic policy. Looks like it's going to serve you. you know, deficit or any debt in the beginning looks like it increases your degrees of freedom. If you overuse it, fetishize it, uh, subject object occurs and you become effectively slaves of, of that debt. You service service debt. So today our, our, our policies are not dictated of what we want, but dictated of what the market dictates. So we have become the slaves of debt, and if we don't defetishize that. And there's a couple of ways I can you, you do that quite easily. You end up exactly, you know, but, uh, under yeah. that, you know, collapse. So in that, I don't think I'm completely, I'm completely idealistic in, in my belief that we can actually come to the point that we de the economy. The mechanism by which we have been able to control human stupidity is well known. It's called religion. And about every religion, except <laughs> I have it switched on. You have it switched on. Do you? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. That's why it's a mona. Okay, say that again. <laughs> I, 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 believe, I don't believe humans can uh, uh, obey so, any instruction. It's a DNA nativa and it has to come from religion. So you tell them uh, something. Uh, people believe that religion are about God or something like that. No. God was something added to make Absolutely. people follow. Yeah. Uh, stuff and uh, and we know that from rituals. Rituals uh, uh, deities come out they emanate from rituals or the rituals emanate from belief in deities. That we know empirically. But the, the, the interesting thing about religion is that take that, right? First time ban Babylon, the Jubilees. Second time Septuagint, right? Neither Bible nor Linda Shelley. Third time boom, ancient Greece few times. Uh, Islam, okay, boom. Catholicism, Aquinas, right? Aquinas has a fatwa on that that's more severe than that of Islam. So if you're Catholic, you should, you know, you should, uh, you know, make your money. So why? Because only religion can effectively enforce, protect you from yourself, with provided it has minimum number of interdicts. It has to have minimum number. So the way you can go to utopia is closer to by use of religion for its real purpose rather than have some uh, civil servant that will invent everything because you read the card. Yeah, but you, you don't need religion to tell us that that is dangerous. Now we know it. I mean, no, now, no, no, no. rationally we know it. We know it. <laughs> we don't know it. The problem is, you know it, you, people forget. Uh, listen, in America, we had the Great Depression. And you look at what happened with that after that. It became taboo to borrow in America after the Great Depression. And every grandmother would force would, would, would tell the grandchild, uh, before I die, make sure you have three years of salary in the bank before you get married. Mm-hmm. 
something, something. It, that was the norm. Until people forgot. Uh, they went and studied economics. And what do you do in school? The problem, the more you study, the more you break from the experience of the past. Yeah. This is why the education, actually, we have, it's another topic. But education has been, particularly in, in economics, and Swiss, the Swiss were very smart about banking, learning apprentice, you know. No break of the chain of learning that has the centuries, all right? The minute you guys started sending people to university, had some nerd, 28-year-old, read a few books teaching, did you forget the past? But would that be part of, would that be part of a utopia, John, to say, okay, no debt, strictly forbid? I think the utopia that I get from uh, what we've been discussing up until now is that rather than thinking we can improve the human world by making people clever, we look back in the past and even into our aspects of the present and realize that what makes the world better are institutions and practices that make human beings less prejudiced. But actually, I think we both agree on this, religion is an antidote to credulity. The more, the, more you take, the more you take religion out of human life, the practice of religion, the more credulous people become. There are more people in Europe who believed in the Euro than believed in the Virgin, ever believed in the Virgin Birth. And in fact, to my mind, the Virgin Birth or the resurrection of the body was less incredible because it was supposed to be a miracle. I mean, the advantage of these old beliefs is they were explicitly said to be miraculous. Where someone believes that Albania and Switzerland, uh, both Switzerland wisely kept out, and Switzerland and Germany and Greece and Cyprus and Malta, all these countries are going to exist under a, a single monetary regime. It's absolutely never happened in history before. And there are good reasons why it's not actually possible. Um, that's a far more fantastic belief than anything in, in, in religion. So in fact, I mean, in a way, maybe the utopian thing is to think that we can recover some of the anti-utopian practices of the past, uh, including, including, including religion, as long as we separate religion, uh, as I think Nassim has said, um, actually, not only from God, but even from belief. Religion isn't really about beliefs. It's a it's tale, the credere. Yeah. When you do credit, credere, all right? The credere is a point. belief, is a complete yeah. epistemic, it's, it's functional, right? I have trust that you will trust. give me this. So it's a trust, not the... Uh, I mean, you can see this perfectly, you know, the name of the crisis in the beginning was credit crunch. So, you know, yeah. that's a faith crunch. Trust you know, crunch. It was a trust crunch. We, it wasn't a normal business, you know, reaction to the lack of growth. It was a religious disappointment uh, of, of religious nature. And let me sort of demonstrate my, my point on interest rates. For example, interest rate is something that was always an ethical or religious topic. So religion and ethics dealt with the idea of interest rate, like Thomas Aquinas and others, and you know, whatever their conclusion was is irrelevant, but it was a topic of theology. Now it's a topic of economics. So today we look at interest rates as if it's perfectly devoid of any ethical context. It is a stuff for economists and it is stuff made of numbers, and it's an analytical, rigorous uh, dictate that you can't even, you know, uh, do something against. It is, it is as if divine, interest rate levels are divine. My point is that it still is, no matter how hard we try to make it an analytical subject, it still is fuzzily, let's say, ethical, first. And secondly, we understand interest rate, we don't understand interest rate. This is what Aristotle, or even others, Old Testament, the Holy Quran, Vedas, come up the codex, everybody was very cautious about the interest rate, basically saying, we don't understand what it does, drive it, drive it cautiously. We built um, our, our system on the pillar of interest rates, but trying to avoid it of, of all other contexts, which I think exactly is a mistake. And my final point here is, um, just because it doesn't look like a belief, doesn't mean that it isn't a belief. So today, we live in most ideological, I would say, time of ever, because before, our ancestors were aware of what it is that they believe. Today we no longer are aware of what it is that we believe. We think it's a fact. So we bought the ideology in its home run. It's sort of not even considered as an idea. The way I put this very same point that Thomas has just made is when you're inside a myth completely, yes. everything in the myth looks like a fact. Precisely. 
The interesting thing about religion is that they've always gone along with profound doubt. I mean, if you go back to Augustine, and even before, or well, before the Jewish thinkers before Augustine, what they say is, for example, um, the Genesis myth is not a literal statement of fact. It's a way of expressing through a story something we can't express in other ways. So actually, uh, faith, in a sense of trust in religion, trust in certain practices and uh, institutions and certain images and symbols, has always gone with deep doubt. But when you dislocate religion, you try to repress religion, get rid of it, or replace it with something more efficient, right? what happens is the myths you get instead are ones that those inside the myth think are facts. Whereas the more genuinely religious people know that their beliefs are very questionable. But carry on with so, There's actually something quite central about skepticism. Mm -hmm. If you look at history of skepticism, we have ways of quite skeptical. So uh, 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 there's a crowd now composed of people uh, with very little mathematical knowledge, like Dawkins, and uh, then make a mathematical statement of probability and, and little historical knowledge. Mm -hmm. Talking about skepticism. David Hume right, was skeptic. The long tradition of that skepticism, skeptical empiricism, isn't about doubting tradition and religion. Yeah. You go with it. Absolutely. You know what it is about doubting? The expert. If you look at Sextus Empiricus, okay, uh, uh, against uh, the mathematical, the grammarian, <coughs> it's exactly the point. The point is he's doubting the expert. And effectively, I remember uh, I got a lot of hate mail, and usually the, the, the ratio of hate mail uh, is indicative of, uh, of, uh, of the importance of an idea, by saying that the doubting the bishop, okay, that was in 2004 when it started, but they believe the security analyst. Okay. How harmful is a bishop going to be for your life? Tell me how much harm a security analyst can cause. So when you look at it, if you weigh things by heart, the doubting. And then That's the other thing is believe. they use evolution to, to, to go against religion, when in fact if you use evolution properly, you realize that every population has evolved some kind of mechanism that has religion at its core. Okay? So for conduct, why? Because to create heuristics of conduct, you can't otherwise. And that's, that's one point. The, the other one I want to say about this space is that the interesting thing about Islam is I went deeply into Islam, why do they ban interest? In fact, they're not banning interest. They're banning one thing. The foundation of the principle is as follows. You can do whatever you want, but I could not in the transaction. Make money if you don't make money. So if I lend you money and you lose money, you, can, you shouldn't be forced to pay me interest. And if you, and if you make money, i got to make money. All right? So it's called sharing. So this is therefore, if any transaction, the only thing they require is in a commercial transaction. If I lend you for personal reason to lend, no interest. But in a commercial transaction, you should have skin in the game. In other words, the lender and the borrower should always share the same uh, uh, type of outcome. So, 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 and, and this is where, uh, where uh, you know, it becomes uh, anti-credit. Uh, tell us about it, because that skin in the game thing is, is, is quite important for, for a future economic system or a future economic practice. Tell us again.